Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Renee Eveland, and I will be your host for this NASA Technology Transfer Program webinar on NASA's Nanostructured Material Sensor Processing Using Microfabrication Technology webinar. Our presenter today is Dr. Gary Hunter. Dr. Gary Hunter is the technical lead for the Chemical Species Gas Sensors Team and lead for Intelligent System Hardware in the Smart Sensors and Electronic Systems Branch at NASA Glenn Research Center. Since his arrival at NASA Glenn, he has been involved with the design, fabrication, and testing of sensors. He was, work he was working closely with academia and industry in developing a range of sensor technologies and sensor systems using a number of different sensor materials and sensi sensing approaches. This work has included the use of both micro and nanotechnology, as well as the integration of sensor technology into smart systems. Dr. Hunter has taught short courses on chemical sensing and high temperature sensors and electronics and co-authored seven books, book chapters, has 12 patents, and has a significant number of papers, talks, and invited talks. He is a fellow of the Electrochemical Society. Following Gary's presentation, I will be giving a short presentation on how NASA licenses technology to outside organizations. Before we get started, I'd like to point out that your microphones will be muted throughout this presentation. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box in the lower right corner of your screen, and we will answer them during the Q&A session at the end. And now Gary will present on NASA's nanostructured material sensor processing using microfabric technology. Hi, I'm Gary Hunter at NASA Glenn. I'm gonna turn this off in a second or so, but I wanted to thank you for joining today. And uh, would like to talk to talk to you about some work uh, that we've done over time related to uh, a range of technologies. But as we move on into the presentation, we'll be talking about the use of microfabrication technology as applied to nanostructured materials. And so now attempting to share. And hopefully we can see the first slide uh, reasonably well. Um, and so people involved in this effort include Jennifer Shu and Aslan Biagi, who are both here. Uh, and uh, we have been associated with uh, what's now called the Smart Sensors Electronic Systems Branch. Uh, and it is in uh, basically this group uh, does a range of technologies, a range of work, often in harsh fireman applications, but uh, across a broad spectrum of, of technologies, uh, from silicon carbide-based electronics, which are able to operate, uh, for example, on the surface of Venus, um, MEM systems for pressure, acceleration, and, uh, and fuel actuation. We're going to talk about in detail some of the gas species sensor work. There's also work in thin film physical sensor technology, again, often for harsh environments and uh, harsh environment nanotechnology. And so one of the unique aspects of uh, what we do is that we can often design and fabricate our own sensor systems. We have our own clean room, uh, both the class 100 and class 1000 facility. Class 100, for example, is made uh, silicon carbide electronics that that have broke world records for their durability and, and uh, a for example, uh, 500 degrees C for, for over a year of operation. Uh, but we've also done a range of other technologies associated with uh, being able to put thin films on the surfaces to measure, measure properties, to be able to etch out structures to make high temperature pressure sensors and, and actuators. And so one of the things then uh, that I'd like to note associated with, with the work you're seeing is that uh, we have a capability to design and then fabricate sensor technologies to meet specific needs for specific applications. And it was in this uh, clean room that, that some of the work that you'll be hearing about later in the talk uh, was, was developed. Uh, overall, our chemical sensing program uh, has addressed a range of applications, and it's built on, on platform technology. And what we mean by that is the idea that you start off with a series of platforms, resistors, electrochemical cells, shocky diodes. Uh, and what you would do is vary those platforms in order to meet a range of different applications, going all the way from, for example, being years back, we, we were in a cargo bay of a jet airplane where 
they were setting fires and we were monitoring uh, the activity. We, we have uh, sensors that are meant to be leak dissection sensors that are multi-parameter, what we call lick and stick technology, uh, sitting at the back end of a jet engine uh, or doing breath monitoring. And uh, so for example, uh, one might, and this is uh, coming from a, a group that we have worked with through the SBAR program, a company by the name of Engineering, you can start off with this platform that's a shocky diode. And if you go to a silicon part of the platform, you can you can make, a te- say for example, room temperature hydrogen sensors or CO sensors. If you go to the silicon carbide version of the platform, it's a higher temperature material. And so you're able to, for example, make hydrocarbon sensors. And, and likewise, as you go across the board, that you start off with a core platform, a diode, a resistor, electrochemical cell, and even the calorimetric system. And by varying the materials and varying the structure, you can get at measuring a range of different types of chemical species. Part of our approach is to make intelligent systems uh, from smart components. That is, drive the intelligence to a local level so that the overall system is in a sense smarter. Uh, you can't make decisions if you don't have information. And if you're gonna make decisions, then we would suggest that the information should be coming from where, where the action is in a sense, where the uh, uh, processes are taking place. And so part of what we are suggesting then is that in order to reach intelligent systems, you first make sensors small and you make them smart. That is, if you, each of your sensors was the size of a bread box, it would be hard to implement into systems. So we want to make them small, but we also want to integrate them with, for example, uh, electronics, smart systems, so that uh, those systems are being able to adapt to the situation, be reprogrammed as necessary. Reliability. There are folks who would often rather not have a sensor than have a sensor that gives confusing information. So the idea that sensors have to be reliable uh, is a fundamental core towards trying to get them applied to applications. Uh, If they're small, easy to apply and don't impact your application and they're reliable, then you can start thinking about redundancy and cross correlation, placing a number of sensors in a region to better understand what's going on within that, that application and environment. And then finally, orthogonality. Our senses, when we try to understand the world, we hear, we see, we smell, we don't, and then those three senses fundamentally operate in different ways. Likewise, uh, as with the platform technology, what we try to do is have sensor technology that have fundamentally different failure mechanisms, false alarms, uh, overlaps, etc. We try to make them orthogonal so you better understand what the what the environment is through the array of sensor technology that you might be ta- using. So one of our first sensors was a hydrogen leak sensor technology. And this is an example of uh, the microfabrication approach, where in a two millimeter uh, area, you're talking not only about one sensor for hydrogen, but a second. You're talking about a temperature detector and heater so that you control the temperature of the sensor. And you're using the basic to same type of technology for this type of fabrication uh, that they use for uh, microchips, not as high level resolution, but you are using uh, semiconductor processing type technology to make small systems, which over time we've applied to a range of applications, uh, all the way from presently a system on the uh, International Space Station to for example, launch vehicle applications. And coupled with that is, so that's almost, a, this is a technology that's based on silicon. Uh, this technology is based on silicon carbide. It's a higher temperature semiconductor. So the same basic operational approach, a shocky diode is in play. But for example, you can go up to much higher temperatures and measure things that the other sensor could. So this is sort of an example of that platform approach, the silicon-based system for hydrogen, silicon carbide for hydrocarbons, and by varying the temperature, you can get different responses coming from the sensor as well, 
uh, higher sensitivity, for example, as a hydrocar hydrogen sensor uh, by operating this at, uh, in this case, 180 degrees C. Uh, then the next step is to integrate it into a smart system. Uh, lick and stick technology. Uh, what you see here is the a basic idea of the lick and stick technology. Three sensors, uh, hydrogen has a different type of uh, response than hydrocarbons, has a different type of response than oxygen. Three together give you a feeling for, for example, whether there's a explosive condition. Uh, integrating into the smart system with different type of wireless configurations, different type of hardware. Uh, this is what we mean by a smart system. And again, through the SBIR program, a company by a MAKO we've worked with for a period of time. Uh, in, for example, uh, trying to uh, implement this type of sensor technology as well as uh, this technology here. This is an example of the orthogonal approach. Uh, in the cargo bay of aircraft previously, uh, there were issues associated with false alarms. Humidity or dust might get on a sensor. And one might think there was a fire when there wasn't. Uh, when we were trying to address this problem, what we did is we came at the problem by using a range of sensor technology, looking at that humidity issue and looking at the particulate issue, but also adding to it CO, CO2, hydrocarbons. And with the combination, the multiple senses in a, a sense is, in a sense, associated with uh, understanding the environment, uh, being able to understand uh, in a way that uh, was different than before. Uh, this is a few years back of, uh, whether or not you actually had a fire. So uh, in this particular set of testing, the traditional uh, alarms at that time uh, uh, had a false alarm 100% of the time in uh, some conditions, say, for example, dust being put onto it. When uh, with this type of system, you are measuring dust, but you're also trying to measure where there are chemical indicators of fire. Well, that uh, in those tests, it did not have a, a false alarm. And so one way of describing our work overall is perhaps encapsulated in this picture. This is a larger sensor uh, quarter for, for size. And what we tend to do is this, make it smaller, microfabricate. Uh, you have to understand the basic second uh, sensing mechanisms to go from here to something like here. But the deal is, is that through through, for example, microfabrication techniques, start to make these things smaller and by integrating it with the hardware, smarter, so as to have a better understanding of the environment. So this is all microfabrication technology. This is the types of processes that people use to make microchips, typically used in the clean, uh, in for some, uh, uh, for us, where we have a low, older clean room, so we're, we're talking roughly, uh, a two micron size line width and the like, uh, but that you know you're using microfabrication processes, uh, and so in the end, then by varying the platforms, by varying the hardware, we have addressed a wide range of applications. Some of the more recent work has been first responder monitoring with a, a proof of concept, a prototype monitoring system for for uh, use by first responders. Uh, all the way through to uh, sticking at the back end of an engine uh, as volcanic ash was put into the engine and watching changes in the emissions coming out. Uh, and then somewhere in the middle, cryogenic fuel lines. So uh, those are some of the things we've done effectively with microsensor technology. And the uh, patent activity associated with, uh, with today's talk is more on how you begin to translate that approach towards nanostructured materials. So, good time ago, folks were making uh, nanocrystalline materials. Uh, and what we were doing at that period of time is taking nanocrystalline materials, materials with grain size on the order of nanometers or so, uh, as I remember around 10 nanometers is grain size, and forming a solution and putting it on these are interdigitated fingers these are effectively fingers that cross each other capacitors that once you put a film on top uh, they can measure changes in the film and so 
the idea of putting nano materials onto a surface with different properties was something we explored over time. And at one point or another attempted to show uh, that uh, one would have this larger continuous monitoring equipment that you could get uh, some of the same response, we would hope coming from a, a micro sensor. And in this case of made of uh, using nanocrystalline materials. And likewise, you could start to take and dope some of the original, uh, some of these materials. In this case, it was tin oxide. Doping them with, in this case, copper oxide, led to material uh, capabilities that were not necessarily seen with tin oxide. Uh, with tin oxide, in this case, those of you familiar with uh, gas sensors, tin oxide is a a very standard material, uh, often used in many types of uh, uh, combustion monitoring sensors, but not usually used for CO2. This showed that uh, by doping those materials with nano nanostructures, this copper oxide in this point, uh, led to a different response uh, than you would than you would typically get out of tin oxide. And so, as we begin to talk about nanotechnology, uh, one of the one of the things we sort of talk about is the idea that you know, chemical sensors, well, they are measuring molecules. Uh, nano control of chemical sensor structures are strongly preferred, even if it isn't labeled a nano sensors. Uh, folks of uh, you know, one way, to, you know, I've heard at one point or another and have suggested uh, that people have been doing nanotechnology for 100 years. It was called chemistry. The idea that you have nanotechnology, the idea that you're bringing nanotechnology into an application doesn't necessarily mean that it will be accepted or that there's an advantage. So one of the questions we've asked, and if nanotechnology is already present in chem biosensing, then what stays the same and what's new? What are the challenges in nanotechnology development? And what's the role and advantage of nanotechnology? What does nanotechnology buy you that microsystems can? So in the end, applications don't really care that it's nano. It does care how it works. It does care if there's improved capabilities. Standard sensor technology requirements, potential and directions are still, still the same. You want something that has uh, reliability, uh, that can has the sensitivity you need, isn't cross sensitive, a variety of things like that. So standard sensor technology uh, directions are still set uh, by the advent of micro technology and, and even non micro technology. You want something that works. Sensitivity, selectivity, stability, response time, tailoring for the applications, making sure you're, you've got a sensor that makes sense for the application, lick and stick technology, all of those things remain the same. Packaging will still be a major part of any technology that uses nano nanostructures. Uh, and as with micro, you can only go as far as you're supporting technologies. If you have a sensor that can't communicate, if you have a sensor that doesn't have a power supply, well, that, it won't only go so far. So multiple platforms may still be necessary depending on the application and environment. You, you may need several sensors, nano or otherwise, in order to measure the environment. So Overall, then, part of what we tried to do is figure out where nano made sense and what were the things you needed to do in order to make nano uh, impactful to the application. Uh, in the end, move towards implementation of the lick and stick technology approach. And so we thought of several things as we went forward. Uh, starting off on this side, uh, controlling the nano stru material structures. Uh, that, as those of you, again, who may be familiar with chemical sensing, uh, the structure of the sensing material is, is awfully important in terms of its response to a chemical environment. We also, and we uh, uh, worked on expanding the range of nanostructures available. Typically, we don't, we don't work in carbon, you'll see some work in carbon in a few minutes. We typically don't work in carbon nanotubes. We tend to work in nano oxide structures. Uh, and so being able to make, for example, 
uh, high temperature materials that uh, have different structure types was uh, was some of what we went about. And and a good amount of what we're going to talk about is this issue of improved nanostructure to micro electro contacts. So in terms of improving nanostructure control, uh, what we had here was uh, uh, various versions of, uh, as we call, tin oxide uh, that were, for example, electrospun. And by electrospunning, you get spinning, which is basically, you kind of can think of it like uh, uh, printing from a, uh, from a printer to, to a degree. Uh, you get this type of crystal structure. Uh, this is another approach where you condensate the uh, tin oxide structures and you get this type of structure and you get very different sensing properties from either one. Uh, then we would look at things like uh, zinc oxide and indium, indium oxide, uh, both with those types of fabrication patterns. Um, this would be, and so we, we were trying to do, you, you saw earlier that we had a lot of tools in our toolbox, we think, when we were using microsystems technology. We had shocky diodes and resistors and electrochemical cells. We were using silicon and silicon carbide as semiconductors and a range of other materials as well. Well, this was some of our work attempting to, to have same type of toolbox available to nanotechnology. Well, one of the things about, and these are really, you know, these are a bit older pictures and, oh, you know, a bunch of this work is is from a few years back. Uh, these are pictures of uh, one way that has been done on occasion to try to make uh, contact with nanostructures, where effectively you, you place them on the surface, and it can get better than this. But the bottom line is is that placing it on the surface over electrodes uh, is is one way to do it is but uh reproducibility and the like those are things that are not necessarily assured by for example uh placing things onto electrodes what we wanted to do is control how you place them on electrodes be able to figure out where you're going to put them uh control how that occurs and so the beginning of this then was to start to use uh, dielectrophoresis uh otherwise known as dielectric field differences to be able to start to align nanostructures onto electrodes and onto surfaces so one would for example have a plus and a minus and have an electric field across and in solution allow for example a nanowire to get caught up by this field and then aligned across these electrodes and so uh, that would occur, and then you would let the solution in which these were literally floating in and then getting aligned to dry off, and then you would have uh, something laying on elect, uh, the surface of two two different electrodes. Uh, and we were able to make some progress in this regard, where we were able to uh, align uh, structures across the electrodes. Wasn't always uniform, wasn't always complete. You ended up with some bunching, depending on how the solution was mixed and how things were initially introduced. But, but overall, the basic idea of aligning, uh, in this case, this was a zinc oxide nanostructure, again, working with oxides, uh, this was how you uh, aligned it. This, this, this could uh, lead to alignment. One thing you didn't see, though, is strong reproducible burying of the electrodes. You didn't, these were laying, they weren't made as part of an electrical contact. And so we wanted to try to improve that. We wanted to make it so you would very much make sure that when these things were laying on the surface, there was strong electrical contact. And so this is, uh, this was some work that we did with the nanostructures uh laying as they were and yes we were going up to 600 degrees c able to make a measurements of propylene and the like but the things that we wanted to uh do is we wanted a, aligned well what we had was uh these structures aligned on the surface with surface contact random control of the surface density 
and it wasn't part of a standard device processing. It was you would place it in, have a separate approach, lay these down. The sensors worked, but we wanted to address these shortcomings, and that's core to the uh, tech. Uh, the tech transfer folks will talk about the patents involved in this uh, this work, but that idea, that drive of having control over what you did with your nanostructures and where they were, uh, that was uh, that was a drive to what we'll we'll be talking about in the next few minutes, and it's it's as follows: the uh, dielectrophoresis to align these structures was positive, but what we wanted to do was go further than that. So when we were doing the dielectrophoresis, it wasn't a solution. Uh, and what happened then is that that solution uh, was something that was standard type of uh, chemical for it. We replaced that chemical. We replaced it uh, with photoresist. Uh, those of you familiar with uh, semiconductor processing um, might know that photoresist uh, is how you make microsystems, how you make microstructures. Uh, photoresist is something that you uh, form a film on a surface, uh, then you can place effectively a mask over the surface and expose the mask and then wash away, depending on the type of photoresist, wash away the rest and now you have an opening where you can do deposition. And the thing about photoresist is that it's, you can make fine lines out of it. You can make smaller structures. Well. Thank you. Whoops, sorry, I wasn't trying to make that other go away. One sec. And so what we wanted to do is start to apply what we knew from dielectrophoresis, but start using standard microfabrication techniques, that is photoresist processing, uh, to start to make uh, microsensors. And this is sort of an idea of the structure, two contact pads on either side, dielectrophoresis. Uh, I mean, uh, these uh, electrodes uh, facing each other. And the idea then is to take and have these electrodes, apply a field, put a solu the photoresist solution on top. What's different about this photoresist solution is that it is a slurry of the photoresist but you don't normally put uh, uh, nanostructures inside of it. Our approach was to put nanostructures inside of the photoresist. It's a liquid uh, for a period of time. It's a liquid and then do the dielectrophoresis to align the uh, structures, the nanostructures across the electrodes and then let the photoresist dry, expose, get rid of the photoresist, uh, and then uh, bury the electrodes on either side. So you have, in this case, a nanostructure across with a, I'm trying to show it here. On either side, you have this, uh, you have stuck the nanostructure in the middle. On either side, the nanostructure sticks out and you put metal on top. And so what you've done at that point in in using standard photoresist processing, in using standard microfabrication technology, uh, you found a way to align the structures and then bury the electrodes. Uh, this, this type of structure is a normal, uh, normal process where you open it up a, a area where you then deposit metal. Now you have a nanostructure stuck in the middle uh, between two contacts that have, have been uh, fabricated on the surface. To go into this a little bit more detail, the steps would be you start with the bottom electrodes, photoresist that has nanostructures inside of it, dielectrophoresis, aligning then the nanostructures. Uh, you get rid of everything. The nanostructures are stuck on either side, held by the photoresist, and then you deposit the metal on top, get rid of the photoresist. And what you end up with then is nanostructures bridging these electrodes with metal on contacts on the top, uh, bound, binding them to the surface. And so this is part of what the, uh, the, the patent that the tech uh, transfer folks will talk to you about. Uh, and we also 
uh, published that data at that time. And so we did it with tin oxide, where you, know, you see sort of this sawtooth pattern here, but you also see here a nanostructure bridging across. This is metal contact on the top, metal on the bottom. You have bound the, uh, the nanostructure to the surface and hydrogen, hydrocarbons. This is typical for this type of uh, tin oxide structure where you would see some type of response at say 400 degrees C uh, for, to both hydrogen and uh, in this case, I believe pro uh, propane. And so the sensor was operational uh, in a way that we would standardly expect, uh, but it's a different type of reproducibility, a different type of structure that we were forming with these nanostructures. Uh, again, we don't tend to use carbon. We don't tend to uh, work with carbon as, uh, as our sensing material, but to show the proof of concept, uh, we uh, also did this with carbon nanotubes. And again, a, a standard response uh, to, with respect to a carbon nanotube, although they have been uh, known to be, depending on doping, uh, uh, responsive to propane. But this response to hydrogen is about expected with, in this case, the, the carbon nanotubes aligned and bridging across the electrodes. And so work was done later to take and begin to show this across a wafer. One of our objectives was to start to bring microfabrication techniques into use with nanostructures. And so microfabrication techniques tend to make a wafer. And in this particular case, uh, we did what we showed ab above, Di uh, the nanostructures inside of a photoresist, photoresist spent on a surface, do the microfabrication processing. And uh, Aslan, who's online, uh, was lead author for the whole wafer design and fabrication for the alignment of nanostructures for chemical sensing applications, where indeed across a wafer, alignment was shown on the vast majority, uh, very much so, of 99% yield of these uh, structures. Uh, and uh, that was across a wafer. And the, at this point then, low magnification, so is the alignment of these structures. Again, buried by the, the second round of deposition. So buried contact of nanostructures with electrodes, control of the alignment of the nanostructures, and inclusion then of nanostructures in standard microfabrication photoresist based processing. So that was one of the things that we tried to do and tried to show the concept of that you're mixing thought, you know, approaches and technologies in this. You're using standard microfabrication techniques, you're using nanostructures, but in the middle, you're mixing dielectrophoresis with microfabrication processing to get this type of result. And so from there, there were some, some other things that we did thereafter. Uh, and again, I, I credit Aslan for this, the, specific, the specific activity I'm about to show now. So carbon nanotubes are often used. What was done in this case is that carbon nanotube was encoded by tin oxide. And then you know, carbon burns. Tin oxide is a solid material that doesn't burn. You take it up to high temperatures and then you burn off the carbon. And what we ended up with is a, basically the carbon acting as a template. And so you ended up with something that was tin oxide, but it acted more like carbon nanotubes than it did, uh, did tin oxide. It showed methane detection at room temperature, which tin oxide typically doesn't do. So we're not quite sure how all of that particularly worked, but the fundamental idea with this template, where you try to transfer, in a sense, the materials of, of carbon to an oxide, get rid of the carbon, but still have some of the capabilities of the, of the uh, carbon uh, sensing, not quite sure what happened, That's, but we were seeing methane detection at room temperature, not common for tin oxide. We also saw that you can go up to, just as you would expect though, uh, tin oxide being responsive to 300 degrees C. 
One of the fun, you know, so this was also patented and this was also the subject of the paper. We didn't explore it, uh, changes in funding and assorted things. Uh, much of this work we're not uh, active in at the moment. But uh, one of the things that we thought is that this templating approach where you, uh, in this case, in the original case, there was carbon we burned off and the thing acted a bit like a carbon-based system. Uh, if we thought we could that be used for other other templates, other biological materials. And so that's something we did not explore, but the idea of you're not trying to use carbon anymore, but you use, say, a biological sensing material. That's something that we had hoped to pursue at that some time, uh, sometime and haven't, haven't quite as of yet. But this was, a, this was an extension and part of this nano, this nanostructures with microfabrication technique. Both of these came together. So where you can, uh, with the templating, have a different type of sensing material, and at the same time, then be able to incorporated inside of a microfabrication process. And so summary and long-term vision was that in terms of micro nano sensor technology, things like uh, orthogonality, multi-parameter, resilient sensors are core to the approach. And you can, and we showed a good number of applications earlier on, uh, you can really change applications with this type of approach, smart sensor systems combined with microsensors that, that are tailored for the applications, that are orthogonal and resilient and selective. And so those are some of the things we tried to do. Uh, and we've often taken these platforms and adapted them to the application. And significant development of a nanotechnology-based sensor platform has occurred uh, with the baseline work in a range of nanostructure sensing devices. Central to this presentation, though, is the use of microfabrication techniques to enable controlled fabrication of microsensors based on nanostructures. Bury contact of the nanostructure in with electrodes, control over the alignment, including of nanostructures in standard device processing, uh, templated approach so in tin oxide, uh, at least we found in these tests seem to give different properties than uh, than what you would expect from oxide. Uh, and overall, uh, we we felt that you could start to place nanostructures in more complex devices. Ours, these devices comparatively were rather straightforward. They were rods aligned and then buried. Well, there could be other steps to the process too. You could have three-dimensional structures. Uh, some folks have been been known to integrate electronics onto structures as you do microfabrication processing. What this allows you to do is have nanostructures put into the microfabrication process, which could be expanded with other other steps in microfabrication. Biomaterials and sensing with the template of nanosensors was, was something we envisioned as a possibility. Uh, in terms of nanotechnology, we have done, uh, so the vision then in terms of what might be possible in the future is the idea of designer chemical sensors. Uh, even with our attempts at select, oops, didn't mean to do that. Even with our attempts at selectivity, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hope this thing up top is going to go away soon. There we go. All right, uh, even with attempts at selectivity, often lock and key is the, you know, what happens for chemical sensing the, or biosensing, something that uh, effectively you have a key, something that has receptors that matches with the species you're trying to measure. And so it comes down and in a lock and key fashion, it fits the lock and then you can make, uh, uh, make a measurement but that may not be highly selective. There may be a whole whole series of keys that meet your lock. And so we, we had hoped over time to uh, continue with the selectivity of the work, continue to make sensors that are beyond, beyond the lock and key approach. And so we go moving towards designer chemical uh, sensors. I'll technically address the fundamental question is what's nano good for? in the area of chemical sensors. Maybe it's not small nanostructures for a billion molecules measurements, 
Maybe it's something for nanostructures designed for detection on the molecular level, going after individual species. Uh, arrange the chemical sensors to fit the molecule in question. Could possibly do more, more work in terms of improving selectivity of sensors and verify the presence of a given molecule with, with say, the electrical uh, electrochemical signal, signal, uh, and signature. So, there are visions of how far you could go with nanotechnology and uh, microsensors, uh, and we've sort of shown a an approach where we've integrated the micro. Uh, microfabrication techniques, but we have done some other work where we've tried even different types of structures. This is not, this is not what we've been talking about so far. This is a different, a different type of animal, but it does use nanotechnology, a nanoplasmatic structure uh, that uh, can, and this is more of the lock and key approach, but uh, you can, where we are able to uh, put uh, say, uh, DNA and such onto a surface. And this is a cavity that is very sensitive to changes on the surface, more so than, than say, a resistor approach, for example. It's a cavity that uh, that is very sensitive. And if you hybridize, if you put things on the surface that can match with DNA, one of the things we showed was, for example, being able to detect DNA we actually did COVID, proof of concept COVID detection using this approach. And where we were going to move with it is uh, plasmonic sensors uh, integrated into smaller platforms uh, that were. So this is another example of what you could do with uh, nanotechnology. Uh, it might, nanotechnology in multiple ways provides uh, new tools, new capabilities towards chemical sensing and other applications, nanotechnology, quantum sensing, all of these things. Uh, and so this is one of the things that we we ended up by doing moving, we still using in a sense, microfabrication techniques, but using those microfabrication techniques in another way. So in the end, the sort of one of the things that we, uh, we would be talking about with respect to this is, uh, and uh, the, uh, the write-up you saw was associated with uh, a previous write-up for this patent. Taking and using the fundamental concepts of microfabrication, uh, mixing it with nanotechnology, getting a new capability, that capability could be used for a whole bunch of things besides we think, besides what we did. And that's uh, that's uh, some of what we're trying to talk about today. So thank you very much for your time. And I guess uh, Renee has a few words to say here after. Okay, thank you for everyone today for your attendance. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, if you have additional questions, please feel free to contact us. Um, and again, thank you for your attendance and thank Gary for a very interesting seminar. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for your interest today. Thank you.